He was also exposed to other elements in his community. The drunks, the slick hair, finely dressed number men, their runners, the fast, loose women reeking of heavy perfume, wigged down in tight dresses with luscious, exploding bodies, the holy rollers, piously dressed in all white or strict black suits, the impeccably dressed gamblers, the owners of flashy cover colored bulky cars, and the neighborhood retard or cripple. He knew a little about everybody's business, just as they knew about his. Many of these images struck him as exciting and represented fun and freedom topped with money. He would listen hard when the grown-ups talked so he could learn about the fast life and community gossip. If he got caught listening, he could count on getting whooped, whopped in the mouth, or sent outside out of earshot. Even if he did not live around such characters, he heard about their existence and they were role models of a sort and helped him have good dreams of growing up and wearing fine clothes and being successful in the street life, cool without working hard. Much of the reality of life between men and women was kept from him. He learned certain things about sex and whispered conversations among his friends. Getting a kiss was considered a big thing. Grown-ups kept grown-up things out of his face private. As far as he knew, being a boy when compared to being a girl, other than the fact that he had a weenie and she had a poontang, only meant that he had to do heavier chores around the house, take out the trash, run errands, carry large packages, stay out a little later, and he could travel farther away from home on his bike or by foot. He didn't have as many clothes as the females around him and he could relieve himself any place he chose while the other girls needed a pot, a room with a toilet and a door. He could also pay rougher games and contact sports. His home life became his routine. It ran smoothly enough and had dependable systems. He always saw his mother going to or coming from work, food shopping, cleaning, ho cleaning house, paying bills, cooking, negotiating with store vendors, participating in church, praying on her knees at home, humming spirituals, picking out his clothes, arranging furniture, talking on the phone. And she was always still up when he went to bed and already up when he rose in the morning. He didn't quite understand how she did all this. And he wasn't quite sure what he was supposed to do since it was visibly apparent to him that his mother took care of practically everything, including all his needs. He knew he had to do what he was told, but other than playing, doing a few duties, going to school and having a few squabbles with his peers, he didn't know what else to do. If he was really poor, he learned early to be ashamed of his condition. He never liked being different because being different kept him from having certain things and feeling good about himself. The toys or games he wanted were usually attached to the value of them placed on him by others in his peer group. Many of their mothers were on welfare or some kind of public assistance, received a type of food stamp coupon, and predictably ran out of money and food before the end of the month came. Welfare checks traditionally arrived on the first day of each month and always generated much activity and bustling excitement in the area. The check amounts varied from about $12 a month to about $200 a month, depending on the number of dependent children in the household, north, south, east, or west. Because of the strict stipulations set up by the government in order to qualify for welfare, he often confusingly witnessed his mother hide an appliance, the telephone, a radio or TV set, a record player, etc., or any item the visiting generally white social worker might deem as an extra and reason enough to reduce or cut off the welfare support check. The worker's attitude was that if a family was on welfare, they were not to have anything considered a luxury other than food, basic clothing, and furniture, furnishings. And there were guidelines on even that. The furniture couldn't be too fancy and the clothes couldn't be too fashionable. There was a distinct welfare look 
And when a family stopped looking like they were on welfare, they were canceled out of the program. Sometimes his mother had to hide her man, maybe his father, outside the house, under the bed or in the closet so that the worker would not catch a man in the house. Word always spread like wildfire in his community if a worker was seen or rumored to be in the vicinity. His memories of the shame attached to welfare poverty are not pretty. The more industrious ones ran errands for neighbors or shop owners, carried groceries, swept steps, emptied trash, or sold newspapers to provide themselves with spending money. He was highly motivated to get his hands on some change and selling soda bottles was not out of the question at two cents or three cents per bottle refunded. Earnings enough money to buy an ice cream cone, some penny candy, or go to the movies was sufficient to boost his pride. Little discussion of his future or the kind of work he would do when he grew up occurred. If he lived with both his parents, things tended to be considerably better. They may have a car, go on real vacations, get dressed up every Sunday, attend a modern school away from the neighborhood, get new clothes seasonably, seasonably, visit the dentist or doctor, eat out in a restaurant, go to camp, or go out of town often on the train or bus to participate in activities with other two-parent children. These parents made his life as comfortable as possible and he was programmed to achieve. He got a chance to learn from his father or his father's work. There were small lessons, but they helped him make social transitions to adult expressions of masculinity and responsibility. Some of the memories are connected to a particular whipping he got for doing something wrong. Unless he was brutalized, black men recall these memories fondly and make jokes about what happened. In the two-parent household, he was more so indoctrinated with the idea that he was just as good as anyone else. He could do anything as long as he got a good education and that he must grow up and be a credit to his race and make his parents proud. Under no circumstance must he be prejudiced against his own kind, whites, or anyone else. His home life was positive as he was programmed with ideas about his future successes. Excuse me, success. Little mention was ever made about the specialness of being black and no information about his proud black heritage was imparted to him and no mention of slavery was ever made. He was told he was a Negro and other than his immediate family history, his ancient past was blurry and unfocused on any unique roots or personal background. He was instructed to be a good American. In some homes, he received a vague explanation about whites disliking blacks because of their skin color, that they were just prejudiced against the coloreds. And every book he read from the first page to the last contained white children or white families with white neighbors. None of the books were about him. During his earliest childhood, he is exposed to other routine experiences. Each Christmas, he was taken to town to go window shopping and sometimes permitted to take a snapshot picture sitting on the wondrous lap of Santa Claus, a mystical character who granted wishes for good little children on Christmas morn. Santa was always white in every picture or decoration. The black boy's eyes would light up with excitement mixed with a little fear as he was led through heavily adorned stores with twinkling lights, puffy white cotton, Sparkling glitter, evergreen trees with all sorts of candy canes and brightly wrapped gifts. These were silver, there were silvery tinsel, tinkling bells, little white elves as Santa's helpers, and holiday songs playing over speakers in stores and on the streets. Decorating the Christmas tree with glistening balls, angel hair that seemed to draw him into its maze and flashing colorful lights was the most beautiful sight he had ever seen. Even the poorest families had a Christmas tree and most of them had wreaths or lights on them in the window. The black boy also the black boy also saw little white children in white flowing gowns with white feathered wings on their backs with a silver halo over their heads hanging from the ceiling in stores. 
perched on lawns and windows and as table centerpieces. He was told that these lovely creatures were angels sent from heaven to celebrate the birth of Christ Jesus. Then, oh, the nativity scene featured a docile looking, gently hooded, serene, pale skinned white woman identified to him as the saintly mother of the Christ child. Next, there was a strong looking bearded white man whose name was Joseph, the father of baby Jesus. And of course, there was baby Jesus himself, glistening white limbs, a divinely beautiful little white baby in a manger in a barn representing the king of kings sent to save the world. The three shepherds arrived on camels from the east with a huge star over their stable barn where Jesus had just been born and wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a bed of straw. This glorious, glorified, mysterious, dramatic story mesmerized his attention and hypnotized him into believing the story and to always honor this saintly family above all things. He was taught that this was the real meaning of Christmas. Silent night, holy night. Santa Claus was like the icing on the cake intermingled with the spiritual and religious connotations santa guaranteed that every parent would teach the christmas story to their children faith and fun what could be more innocent santa and his elves a fat jolly old timer also called saint nick enjoyed a reputation of being the first always smiling kind and good doing white man the black boy had never met Santa, for many years, was allowed to take the credit for gifts of happiness to him. Present and toys purchased with hard-earned black dollars, even going into debt, was attributed to the beneficence and goodness of a jolly old white man in a red suit with a white beard who traveled in a sled that flew across the sky pulled by reindeer, led by Rudolph with a shiny, blinking nose. It was suggested to the black boy that if he put out cookies and milk, that Santa would eat them during his visit after he tumbled down the chimney to put gifts under the tree. For many years, the black boy believed the story. And by the time he was told or found out on his own that Santa was just a fairy tale made up to entertain him, the black boy had spent many a night dreaming about Santa and swooning to the words, of twas the night before Christmas. He was very susceptible to imaginary heroes who treated him good. Every black boy in America was taught the same two aspects of Christmas, Christ Jesus' birth and Santa Claus. Being so impressionable, he believed the people he trusted and trusted the people he believed in, baby Jesus and Santa Claus and his mother, who endorsed them both. At another time of the year, he was introduced to Valentine's Day. A day, he is told, means love. This love was best expressed with a red-shaped symbol to replicate the heart, which was sometimes pierced with an arrow looped across it, or accompanied by one or two chubby little white babies called cherubs. The cherubs had a tiny bow and arrow, which they were able to shoot into the heart of couples to make them fall hopelessly in love with each other. The heart became his idea of love. He was never told who St. Valentine was, and his parents didn't know either, but all of them knew that Cupid and his little bow and arrow spreading love and heart shaped boxes of candy and pretty red and white greeting cards, which he distributed on a miniature level among his closest school friends. Then there was St. Patrick's Day a day about a white saint and a day he was to wear something green to commis commemorate St. Patrick. Along with St. Patrick came a bunch of little elderly white midgets in green suits with pointed green hats and curled toe green slippers called leprechauns, mischievous little fellows who played pranks on unknowing bystanders. It had something to do with Ireland and the Irish people who celebrated their folklore with gutsy ales and other festivities. One of his favorite holidays was April Fool's Day. Few black parents knew how this holiday originated, but they did know that it was a day to play tricks on friends or make a joke of some sort. And when the person falls for the act of information, 
The culprit calls out April Fool, a bit of lying and devilishment in the name of fun. The black boy would run around the neighborhood, the house and the schoolyard yelling, April Fool, April Fool, after he played a successful trick on someone. How entertaining. George Washington, the first president, was the father of his country. And Betsy Ross sold the first American flag. He knew about the cherry tree too. In the midst of these came Mother's Day and Father's Day. If his mother was alive, he wore a red rose on his lapel. If she was dead, he wore a white one. This procedure was repeated on Father's Day also, which never got as much attention as Mother's Day. Throwing in Groundhog's Day, Veterans Day, Labor Day, and May Day, the next major holiday he was taught was Thanksgiving. Blessed Thanksgiving, decorated with colorful fall leaves and beautiful fruits and vegetables protruding out of a horn of plenty, kind of like a basket shaped like a long funnel. Thanksgiving was explained to him as the day when a small group of friendly white settlers came to America and sponsored a big sit-down dinner for the native Indians and taught them how to bake, break, how to bake, break, set a table, and eat pork. This represented the exchange of goodwill between the whites and the Indians and their agreement to share cultures. Whites and the Indians and their agreement to share cultures with each other. This grew to include donating gifts of food for the less fortunate. The first Thanksgiving was described as a merger and a peaceful unification initiated by whites. He was taught a great deal of detail about the European pilgrims, but given only superficial notation on the Indians. Plus, he knew the Indians were not really the good guys because in the movies, the Indians always wanted to fight and kill off the settlers. He loudly cheered when he heard the familiar trumpet sound of dumpty, dumpty, dumpty dum as the organized white troops charged in to kill the Indians and defend their fellow immigrants. He felt good every time a cavalryman slew an Indian and got him back. The black boy participated in school plays about the first Thanksgiving in school and wore pilgrim clothes or Indian feathers. His teacher didn't mind that he was left out of every story, every holiday, and every celebration or tradition or routine ritual recorded by Americans. After all, what difference could it make? The important issue was the celebration of the event itself, and all children should enjoy and respect their country. The 4th of July was special to him because it signaled a picnic, nighttime fireworks, and celebrations at school. He would happily don his red, white, and blue hat he made in class, or proudly wear his own hand-drawn American flag on his shoulder or shirt pocket, and he could recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America with his little hand held over his heart. He would swear with all his youthful honesty that he would support his country and all it stood for, status quo unknowingly included. He was told to be proud of the day that the Declaration of Independence was signed. Of course, he didn't know what independence meant and no detailed explanation followed from his teacher or parents. At home, The 4th of July took on a lesser patriotic meaning and featured barbecue pork ribs, hot dogs, burgers, potato salad, cake, pies, baked beans, and maybe even some homemade ice cream, all eaten in the backyard, out front, or at a public park for a fun-filled picnic. He loved the fireworks, the happy spark of Twizzlers, and the fiery blast of cherry bombs. The colorful parades with balloons and all were the most fun of all. On Easter, he knew he would probably get some new clothes, get dressed up, go to church, walk around downtown, or go home showing off his new threads. He might attend a movie, go to a carnival, an amusement park, take a long exploring bus ride with his pass, and eat a snack while out. He was taught in church and at school that Easter is the day that Jesus rose from the dead three days after he was killed on a cross the previous Friday, Good Friday. Jesus had been nailed to the cross through his hands and feet until he expired from blood loss and unbearable pain. The black boy was shown in books and read and read. The black boy was shown in books and read to out of the Bible about how Jesus wore a crown of thorns, 
was offered briny vinegar water to drink and suffered through it all with dignity and everlasting strength. The actual pictures of the crucifixion drawn or painted by European artists were shown to him at a very early age and represented the first gory sight of a dead white man presented to him as reality. He saw white men killed in the movies, but he knew they were just actors and not dead for real. He was told that Jesus in his unselfishness died for his sins and those of the entire world. Easter was the first holiday in which the black boy learned more about religion and also was the first occasion that he got a chance to hear God speak. There were always TV Easter specials or movies at the theater depicting the death of Jesus. In the movies, God was always portrayed as having a big, booming, baritone voice that thundered from behind the clouds or sun. God always spoke to make vibrations in the air and cause fear every time he talked to earthlings. The big God in the sky also was invisible. He could recognize Jesus, Mary, Joseph, and the 12 disciples by sight, but it was a mystery to him as to what God actually looked like. So how would he recognize him? Church had taught him that Jesus was Jesus really represented the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So they would all have to look alike. So Jesus, the slender white male with the pale brooding eyes, shoulder length, thick, dark brown hair and keen nose was also God. Thereafter, whenever confronted with biblical photographs, he was able to pick out God from the rest of the white people and could even recognize him in the Last Supper, Supper portrait. Jesus slash God had very distinctly different features from the other f guests at the table. He recognized Jesus on church fans, Bible school cards, calendars, wall hangings, and greeting cards. He became comfortable that he would, could recognize his savior. It had already been explained to him that he must not sin. Sin was described to him briefly as lying, cheating, stealing, doing any kind of wrong. Drinking, using drugs, sassing, staying out all night, not saying his prayers, not going to church or being plain disobedient. He would go to hell after he died. The hell place contained every horror imaginable. It had everlasting scorching flames, fire that would never go out, a big boiling pot with smoke all over the room. In this hell place was another white man in a red scuba diving type suit with red horns on top of his head. He had a long tail with an arrow at the end of it and a permanent evil scowl on his face. The devil was designed to scare him into doing right, obeying the Lord and refraining from sin. Hell was not the place he wanted to go after he died. The stories about hell frightened him. The fact that hell was deep underground made him feel no better. And if it rained while the sun was shining, he was taught that this meant the devil was beating his wife. He had not previously been told that the devil was even married, but he believed it anyway. Simultaneously with teachings of Jesus' death, Raising from the dead and floating slowly up into the sky, he was taught about Easter bunnies. They laid colorful hard-boiled eggs that came in cute little baskets with green straw and all sorts of chocolate and colorful goodies to eat. He knew nothing of the reproductive system of mammals and whatever he knew about chicken laying eggs was suspended because the Easter bunny was so much more fun. He liked the new games of hiding the eggs and finding them dyeing them with bright colors, putting designs on them, and writing his name on them. And of course, he got to eat all he could hold. Candy chickens, jelly beans, marshmallow rabbits mixed in with all the other special goodies hidden in his basket. Sometimes he even got his own stuffed bunny plaything. He saw real rabbits in books or in school, but it didn't care if bunnies laid eggs or not. He enjoyed the goodies. The tooth fairy was a pretty good idea too. If he lost a tooth, 
He could put it under his pillow and in the morning he would have money in its place and the tooth would magically be gone. He grew to look forward to those yearly festivities and the symbols and myths surrounding each holiday, which were reinforced in school, in church and at home by his mother and sometimes father too. The predictability of them made him secure. Everybody knew about them. Everybody celebrated them and everybody liked them. What a comfort. At least life had some good points that he could look forward to every year and benefit from. Stories supporting these holidays were ingrained in him before he left kindergarten. Of course, he celebrated the major holidays at home even before he got to school. But school explained them in more details and absorbed his participation on another level as a requirement. School expanded on the meanings and their value to his development. School supported this process by plastering pictures on the walls, on the blackboards, in the halls, windows, and cafeterias. He was prompted to draw a portion of each story about each holiday and then join in class celebrations, usually in the form of a party. His mother and his teacher stood as the main authority figures in his life. From kindergarten on, he was fed more and more details of these holidays so as to firmly implant them in his brain. Kindergarten means children's garden, a garden to grow the child's mind into certain fertile ideals for readiness to take steps towards adulthood and self-sufficiency. The black boy was surrounded with seeds of information alien to his history and lifestyle. These ideas were implanted to in him at a very early age, and he was abruptly weaned from any suggestions that might bloom into self-worth or self-value. His growth was non-political towards his own kind. He was bored, he was bred to ignore his own presence on the earth. Prior to his formal education, several other fictional personalities were introduced to him of skeptical value. If he got particularly out of hand or if his mother or another adult taking care of him needed to control him after threats or spankings had failed, they would evoke a few other monsters especially designed to make him behave. First, the boogeyman, an ugly, mysterious man who scares, kidnaps, or kills bad little children. Two, a ghost, a dead person who came who comes back from the dead to get him and to do terrible harm by scaring him senseless. Three, the monster, a horrible type of creature with distorted features who would claw his skin or gobble him up if he was bad. All of these characters existed in the dark when the lights went out. They were all used when applicable to scare the black boy into behaving in a desired way. Although thought to be temporary in value and usage, this tactic was never quite forgotten by the black boy. Their existence was seemingly forgotten by the black boy. Their existence was seemingly validated on a holiday like Halloween when the witches and goblins came out from somewhere to scare little children. On Halloween, he got to dress up in a funny or scary costume and go out trick-or-treating, which meant he went from door to door of strange homes saying trick-or-treat and would get some kind of morsel of candy, fruit, or snack. He loved to wear a mask or paint his face. This Halloween holiday was also gaily celebrated in school with costume parties and refreshments. If he received no treat, the tricks surfaced in riding on people's cars or house windows with soap, throwing eggs or turning over trash cans or some other prank designed to hassle households who did not provide treats. Interestingly, all of the holidays the black boy was taught about contain various aspects. Interestingly, all of the holidays the black boy was taught about contain various aspects of fear and the supernatural. They also instilled certain ideals and imprinted Western values in his head, all rooted in expressing gratitude, honor, and respect for white males. 
Additional to the festive holidays, during his first few years of school, he learned about Abraham Lincoln, a former American president who freed the slaves. His little brain was too undeveloped along with his short attention span to give him any long, drawn-out political explanation about old Abe and his real position on slavery. No one told him that Mr. Lincoln made a strictly political decision that public relation-wise awarded him the misleading credit of freeing the slaves. This was the first major mention of slavery he ever heard of. He was programmed with the impression that Negroes were happy slaves and needed the master to take care of them. He was told stories about how the slaves sang while they worked and danced all night. Nothing was mentioned to him about how Negroes became slaves or where they originally came from. He was just taught to be grateful to old Abe for setting the slaves free. Lincoln, a tall white man, but nice as Johnny Appleseed. Christopher Columbus was always highlighted for his masterful discovery of America, which he accomplished in 1492 by sailing across the ocean from England in three ships supplied by his queen. It was quite easy to teach the black boy about boats floating on water with a great captain at the helm. Teaching black boys to be grateful to Columbus is one of the worst travesties of misrepresentation ever inflicted on him. Telling him to respect and honor Christopher Columbus is like teaching a Jewish child to celebrate Adolf Hitler Day. It is that far from the truth. This falsified history historically incorrect information is still taught to the black boy today despite serious scholars announcing that Columbus introduced western colonialism capitalism and slavery on the North American continent furthermore studies show that he was already entertaining a few pre-nazi theories on the natural supremacy of the white race proceed proceeded to inflict genocidal practices of the native Indians who were already set up and functioning in their own civilization when Columbus first docked. Old Chris was eventually debunked and jailed for unscrupulous politics. Every notable or famous individual that the black boy was introduced to, be he real or imagined, was in the personhood of a white male. Thus, he completed nearly 13 years of public school education, acknowledging that every commendable action or intellectual victory was attributed to the white man. Nobody ever taught him during his formative years of the black man's place in history or his record of achievements. He had no knowledge of his own people or their contributions to math, science, medicine or art. His own parents rarely mentioned black history to him. His church did not place blacks in any biblical context. And it was subtly suggested to him that being colored a Negro or black was something bad and undesirable. And if somebody insulted him by calling him black, he was always ready to fight about it. He wasn't black and he didn't want anybody trying to say he was. Black was a bad word only used in anger and hatred Amongst another Negro, this system of loading the black boy's brain with foreign data put into motion an adult black male who left home to confront the world and his destiny with absolutely no knowledge about his past with a white man's name an Anglo-Saxon religion and a memory dedicated to Western values that would plague him for generations to come. This intentional cover-up laid the foundation for the confusion and displacement that would eventually lead to his present endangered classification. The ultra-critical years between 1940 and 1990 produced the current perilous legacy of the black man, his sons, and his grandsons. This book is about the damaging effects of the brainwashing that the black man was subjected to during the first during that 50 year period. And it represents the first contemporary debriefing session he has had since slavery.